Okay. So you guys should have um, gone through the PowerPoint last week when you were remote on the 12 steps of bread baking. So these are universal. These are the 12 steps that everybody across the country, across the world knows that the bread goes through from start to finish, okay? So these are the terms that people are going to be using, especially when you get out in the industry, if you're going to be working at a bake shop, you need to know these terms, be familiar with them, and know what they're referring to, okay? So you guys are all the way to step three right now. So I'm just gonna go through them and what's important about each one, what I want you to kind of remember about each one, um, some we've talked about before, some we'll be talking about as the day uh, goes on. So first step in your process is scaling. So the first thing that you need to do is determine what type of scale you're going to be using. I went over this last week during the lecture. The difference between a digital scale and a balance scale. So pros and cons I covered last week. Balance scales take a little bit longer to use, but there's no limit on how much you can weigh on a balance scale. As long as you have a container that's big enough and you have the weights that correspond, you can weigh an infinite amount of ingredients. As opposed to a digital scale that has a maximum capacity that you can weigh on it. Most small digital, actually, Elizabeth, flip that scale over. Tell me if there's a sticker on the bottom and it'll say like max load or it'll have a little number on it. Right yep. It says 13.2 pounds. 13.2 pounds. So that's the most amount of weight that you can weigh on those little digital scales. So it's really important before you start using a digital scale to check the bottom because um, otherwise it's, it's not going to tell you. So like sometimes you'll get a little read on the screen that says like, um, it'll say like unsafe or error. Um, but sometimes it'll just, the numbers will just start fluctuating and you're gonna, it'll go down to like 10 pounds and then up to 13 pounds and then down to 11 pounds. So just always check on the bottom of this scale. So the good thing about a digital scale is that you can change the units that you can work in. So there's a little button on the scale that you can change from ounces to pounds to grams. And it's a lot faster to use. You put the container on, you zero it or tear it, it's the same thing as balancing, and then you just wet. Super, super fast, super easy, but it limits you on how much you can weigh at a time. So when you're using large recipes for a large scale production that calls for 22 pounds of flour, you're gonna have to weigh several times and then try to keep track, and that's a disaster, okay? Um, Another downside to balance scales is that you either need batteries or you need an outlet. And um, you don't always have that. So a balance scale, it's a very simple mechanism. As long as you have a counterweight and you have a bowl to weigh in, you don't need other specialized um, tools or equipment to, to use it. Okay? We're good on scaling? Most important thing about using your balance scale is balancing the scale, right? Making sure that every time you replace the container that you're weighing into, that you rebalance your scale, okay? And for us in scaling, we always make sure that most times everything is in weight because weight is way more accurate, okay? So very important about scaling is making sure that all of your measurements are accurate because baking is all math and science. So you want to make sure as you're scaling that you're using it correctly so that your ingredients are accurate so that, you know, your formula works. Mixing. Depending on the dough that you're mixing, you're going to use a different mixing method. So you guys are making lean yeast doughs or LYD, lean yeast doughs. So for lean yeast doughs, you're using your, what method? Straight. Wife, straight dough mixing method. Water, yeast, food, everything else. Okay, also known as your straight dough mixing method. Okay, so just remember, the type of dough will determine the mixing method. When you're looking at your different formulas, three ingredients are going to tell you what type of dough it is. 
Do you guys remember which those three ingredients are? Fat. Fat. Sugar and eggs. Those are the three ingredients that determine if a dough is a lean yeast dough or a rich yeast dough. Fat, sugar, eggs. So that, did you go over the mixing for a rich yeast dough yet? No. Oh, okay. Okay, so once you're done mixing, then we move into bulk fermentation. Bulk fermentation is what you guys are doing right now. It's when your dough is fermenting in a big piece. Okay, so it's your just your piece of dough straight out of the bowl. That's why it's called a bulk, because it's in bulk. It's a big piece. Okay? Usually bulk fermentation happens for about an hour. Okay, so that's why... Um, I didn't see you guys do it, but uh, in the, oh, maybe I didn't put this in the demo. Um, did I have you guys do this last week? I can't remember. Label what time yeah. it came out of the mixer yeah. so that um, I make sure that we don't get go past. The maximum that I would do bulk fermentation for is like an hour and 20 minutes. Um, I usually do it for about an hour. However, your temperature of your room and the humidity is going to greatly affect how quickly your doughs ferment. Your doughs last week, because it was so hot in here, they were fermenting while they were mixing in the bowl. I don't know if you guys noticed that, but you know, it was like expanding, expanding, expanding. By the time you guys took them out of the mixer, they were like giant. Um, so your temperature is going to greatly affect how long you will ferment for. Okay, so room temperature about, I'll call room temp like 65 degrees. You know, usually in bakeries, it's a little bit warmer than that. Um, we'll, we'll go with uh, an hour. Okay, if it's cold, then your dough is going to move much slower. Okay, because your yeast is activated by warmth. The warmer your yeast is, the faster it's eating, or the more it's eating. And therefore, it's fermenting or it's creating your two byproducts of fermentation, your alcohol and your carbon dioxide. Those are your two byproducts of fermentation. That's what's created when your yeast is eating the sugars that are available to it in your dough right now. Okay, so the warmer it is, the faster it's eating, and the more it's growing. It is possible to over-ferment your dough. So a good way of knowing when you're done with bulk fermentation is not just by the time, but by looking at it. So you can see that it's doubling in size, and you wanna give it a little bit of a tap on top, just a little bit of a poke. You always wanna be nice to your dough, treat it like a lady, okay? Just a little gentle love tap, and you shouldn't leave a fingerprint in the dough. When it rises back and you don't leave like a little dent, that's how you know that you're done with bulk fermentation. That means that your yeast has eaten the sugars that are available to it, and you're ready to move on. Now, if your dough starts to collapse onto itself, that means that you're over fermented. That means that your yeast ran out of food and it's over producing alcohol. And it's going to be a very, very unpleasant taste in your dough. You can't get rid of that. So once you're over fermented, then it's a little bit hard to gain control over your dough at that point, both in flavor like and texture. So then it's garbage, usually. Because it's, what is it? It's a, is it bitter or something? It's a it, taste. It, the yeah. best way that I can describe it is it's like, um, it's kind of like eating cornbread. Like, you know how it just kind of like crumbles? Okay. That's how the final texture of the dough is going to be. Okay. If, if it's over fermented like really badly, it's just kind of like, yeah. crumb, it's like this weird, like an English muffin almost, like with the nooks and crannies mm -hmm. and like dry like that. That's how the interior is uh, if you bake an over fermented dough. If you catch it like right as it's starting to over ferment, you can save it. Ah. Um, by folding. Okay. <laughs> um, but if it's like totally, totally collapsed, then it's basically garbage. Yeah, so paying attention to what your dough looks like, how long it's fermenting, what the temperature of the room is, all of these are factors in making sure that your final product is perfect or sellable, right? Sellable is what we're going for, right? Because you want to make money, right? In the industry. If it's not sellable, you're not making money. Okay, so bulk fermentation, and then we move on to folding. Folding, I think that I had you guys watch these videos last week when you were remote. So folding is where you degas your dough, so you 
slap it down and all of those gases um, that have formed during bulk fermentation, the extra ones kind of just, you get out, you expel them. And most importantly, you're redistributing the food to the yeast. So as I described in that video, you have your yeast molecules all throughout your dough. Your yeast is feeding on the food that directly surrounds it. The yeast can't move, it doesn't have legs, right? It's a living thing, but it doesn't have legs. So your job as the baker, there's other food available to it throughout the dough in other spots that your other yeast molecules haven't eaten. But you need to redistribute all the food that's available back to those yeast molecules so that it can continue feeding. The more it feeds, the more it grows, the more flavor it's creating. The alcohol and the carbon dioxide, that's what's giving you the flavor in your dough. Okay? So folding is really important to keep your dough fermenting, but to also strengthen your dough. Every time you fold it, you're strengthening the gluten. I know we haven't totally covered gluten yet, so for now, just kind of tuck that in the back of your brain and we will get to it, okay? Perhaps tomorrow's lecture. Okay, so folding. You fold so that you can redistribute the food to your yeast, expel extra gases, and then a third one that I didn't put here is to strengthen your dough. Okay, I don't have that written here, but your third reason for folding is to strengthen your dough. Which means strengthening the gluten strand. Yes. Okay. So as soon as you guys are done folding, and we're going to continue with these steps, so you guys will be able to work through all of these today, so that you can put a, a, a technique to a name. Um, so once we're done folding, we go straight into dividing. So what's important about dividing is, once again, we're using your scales, right, because we want to make sure that everything is the same size. We're going to be using a tool called a bench scraper. So it's very similar to the bowl scrapers that you guys have been using, but it's metal with a handle. I have them to um, hand out to you guys. If you have the baking knife kit, it comes in your knife kit. I didn't see that. It, but... it might be in one of the zippers. Oh, look again. I didn't see that, and I didn't see the bowl scraper. Really? They should be together. Usually they're together um, with the pastry bag. I didn't see that either. Ooh. I hope I got the right thing. You too. It did say baking. Hmm. Okay. All right, we'll go through it. Thanks. Okay, so dividing. You want to make sure that you have your measurement in mind. Depending on what your final product is going to be, will determine how big you're going to scale your dough to. So for dinner rolls, like you guys are doing today, we're doing one and a half ounces, 1.5. If we're making baguettes, I usually scale to about 11 ounces. If we're braiding hollow, we're gonna do 2.25 ounces. If you're making pretzels, you're gonna do four ounces. So everything depends on what your final product is. And the reason that you want them all to be the same weight is one, so that they bake at the same time and they bake evenly, and two, so that you can sell them for the same price. Consistency is what's going to keep your customers coming back. So you want to be accurate in your measurements, as in when I say it's four ounces, I mean four ounces, not 3.1, not 3.25, not three and a half, four. Four means four, okay? Again, easier to do on the digital scale than the balance scale, but today we're using the balance scale. Okay, so accuracy in your measurement and consistency, meaning each one should be consistent. Every pretzel should look like the next pretzel in size, in weight, in aesthetics, in bake, in color, in everything, okay? Consistency is what's gonna keep your customers loyal. Once you divide, then we're gonna go into pre-shaping. The best example I can give for pre-shaping is a baguette. Baguettes are 21 inches long. They, um, they're five ounces by weight, 21 inches long. They have five. It's only 11 ounces. Oh, 11 ounces. I'm sorry. Five, yeah. Five ounces for German pretzels. 11 ounces. Okay. 11 ounces by weight, 21 inches long, and five slashes or scores. Okay? If it's not 21 inches and it doesn't have five scores, it's not a baguette. Now, to get your piece of dough that's about this big to 21 inches, you have to give it a pre-shape. So you need to kind of get it into initial sh in a, an initial shape about halfway 
to how you, you want it in its final shape. But if you try to get that small piece rolled out to 21 inches, you're gonna overwork the proteins or the gluten. And when you overwork the gluten, it's gonna start to snap back to much smaller and then you're never gonna achieve it. Then it starts to get sticky. Um, it, gluten kind of, it's like a bell curve. It starts out uh, really weak and as you mix it, it gets stronger and stronger. It reaches its maximum peak. The more you mix it past that, the weaker it gets. Okay, so once you reach that peak, you need to kind of be very careful not to go over that mountain. Um, so your pre-shaping is gonna help prevent that overworking. So what you do is you basically shape it halfway or you kind of give it an initial shaping and then you let it rest, step seven. Bench rest is when you're taking those individual portions, you let them rest on your bench, on your, your workstation. Cover them with plastic wrap so that they don't dry out the same as you guys are doing right now, okay? Bench rest only lasts about 20 minutes. It's just enough so that your gluten that's like super, super, super tight has a chance to relax. And then you can go back and do the final shaping on it. So then from there, as in a baguette, you take it from the nine inches that you rolled it to out to the 21 inches. And then you'll be able to maintain the integrity of your dough, the shape, the texture, the consistency, all of that. Okay? So bench rest is very important. It goes hand in hand with pre-shaping and final shaping. Okay? Now your final shape, again, goes back to the same as dividing. You want to make sure that you're being accurate in how you're shaping and consistent in how you're shaping. 21 inches means 21 inches, not 18, not 19, not 23. Okay? Because remember, the longer you make it, the thinner it's going to be in the center, and that's going to affect the final texture on the inside. Okay? Wait, is it the baguette is 21 inches? Thin, like once you roll it to 20, you're, you're shaping it to 21 inches. It's going to stay 21 inches, not going to shrink. Are you saying you're taking a nine-inch pre-shape and then shaping, final shaping, you're bringing that to 21 inches, mm -hmm. and that dough stays? Oh, because it's in that form and yeah, everything. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yep. It kind of looks like a sword. Mm -hmm. And remember, it's going to double in size when it proofs. True. So it might look thin as you're rolling it out, but it's going to double, and then it grows even more in the oven. And that's how you get that nice, you know, thickness. Okay, so accuracy and consistency in your final shaping. Once you're done final shaping, we move into proofing. Proofing is also called second fermentation. Um, it's when you are fermenting your dough, it's just in smaller, in their individual portions, your rolls, your baguettes, your pretzels, and they proof in a warm and moist environment, okay? Warm and moist, and it's usually about 20 minutes. So we use our proofer back here. This controls, this has um, water that gets sprayed into it and it also has um, a heater. So it keeps it nice and warm and it keeps it moist so that your dough doesn't dry out, okay? If you don't have a proofer, you can just find the warmest part of your house, your bake shop, wherever you are, and just cover your sheet pans with plastic wrap. I, I usually, if my proofer is like, um, if they're doing maintenance on it and I have to bake, I'll just drag a rolling wrap in front of the oven and I'll put my, my, all my doughs there and I just cover them with um, clean garbage bags. And I keep them there because it's warm in front of the oven. And then the covering them with either a garbage bag or saran wrap help prevents them from drying out. Okay, so just because you don't have a proofer doesn't mean you can't make bread. Okay, you just need a moist and warm environment. During proofing, your dough doubles in size. But again, it can over ferment. So you have to make sure that you catch it before it before your yeast runs out of food. So you wanna just keep looking at it, touch the tops of your rolls or your baguettes or whatever it is, and you're looking for that fingerprint to bounce back at you, okay? Scoring. Scoring means that we're cutting slits into the bread. So like I said, baguettes have five scores. Um, the tool that we use is called a LAM, L-A-M-E. L-A-M-E, it's French 
for blade or razor. I think right now all of mine are at home from when we were doing uh, remote learning, so I have to remember to bring it tomorrow to show you guys. Um, but it is a specific tool. They have blades, it's like a rectangle and it has blades on both sides. Um, they are a, it's a specific tool so that you don't cut too deep. If you were to use um, a paring knife or a serrated knife, you run the risk of cutting too deep into the dough and then it doesn't rise the way that you want it to, okay? But there's three reasons why we score bread. One is for the chef to put their personal signature on it. So if you ever go to different bakeries, you might see that they have different letters cut into their breads and that's to identify the, the bakery. So Baltazar Bakery in the city, they score bees into their big loaves. Um, this goes back to when villages used to have uh, village ovens that families used to bake their breads in. And they would have, you know, bread baking day on the second Saturday of the month and every family would go down to the village oven and they would bake their breads. Well, how are you gonna know who's who's when they come out of the oven? So they would score their family name or their crust or their, uh, you know, pattern into the breads so that when they came out of the oven and they were cooling, they knew, okay, that's my bread. That's for my family and that's what they, that's what they used. So, in modern day, it's how we identify the chef's signature or the bakery's signature, okay? Um, between me and Chef Long Talk, we identify our roles between the number of scores that we give to our doughs. My class usually scores with one slit. Her class is usually score with three. So, um, you know, it, it's just a way for the chef to put their mark on it. Another reason for scoring is so that you can identify the type of bread that it is. So think of it more in terms of a restaurant. When you have your back of house supplying front of house with a bunch of varieties of dinner rolls, right? And you as the server goes to a customer's table and they say to you, well, I'm dairy free. Do any of these you know, breads have butter in them or any type of a, a dairy? Or someone says, I have a nut allergy. Do these have any nuts in them? Sometimes you can't see dairy in your breads. Nuts are easier to see, but dairy you can't. Cheeses melt, butter melts, right? You saw the milk powder, you can't even identify that it's in your bread. So if back of house or the baker says, okay, this is gonna, these are gonna be our markings so that we communicate with our serving staff. All of our breads that have dairy are gonna have one score. All of our breads that have nuts in them have two scores. All of our breads that are gluten free are gonna have a crisscross. And then that way, front of house can feel more comfortable when they're serving, that they know what, how to identify the different types of breads. And then that creates customer satisfaction and a more even flow to service. Is that standard in the industry? I mean, I, I guess I've never paid attention to it, but maybe in a finer restaurant. Fine, yeah, fine dining, it's more, because they're doing their in-house bacon. Yeah, okay. Um, a, lot of, a lot of restaurants don't, um, employ in-house pastry chefs yeah, or they bakers. Get it out. Yeah, yeah. They order it out. Yep. Okay, and then your last reason for scoring is so that your steam can escape from your bread. So as your bread is cooking, there's moisture inside your dough and that needs to let out in the form of steam. If you don't cut a slit, a purposeful slit in your dough, your steam has to escape somehow and it's gonna escape out of the weakest point, which is usually the seam, or it's, it's like where your dough forms on the bottom. And what ends up happening is it kind of explodes out of that point, and then you have these very um, unappealing looking rolls. Not that they're inedible, but they're not sellable. Remember, accuracy and consistency is what keeping, what's keeping your customers coming back, it's what's making you money. Okay? So you want everything, every roll to look the same. You want all your pretzel rolls to look the same to each other. You want all of your egg rolls to look the same. So your scoring is very important so that your steam can escape out of that score and it opens up in the oven very nicely. Okay, now once you score, you have to bake right away. If you don't have space in your oven, you can't score. Okay, so you're only as good as your equipment is. If you don't have an oven 
that is big enough to take the capacity that you are making bread at or that you're proofing at or that you're shaking at, everything is not going to be in line with each other. I have a giant proofer. I also have a giant oven. If I had a really small oven and this whole proofer was filled with rolls that were ready to be baked, what are you going to do? All those rolls are going to over ferment because I don't have enough oven room to bake them. Okay? So everything goes hand in hand. Okay, so once you score, you have to bake right away because otherwise your dough is deflated. You're just letting out all those gases that are supporting your dough, all those gases that made your dough rise. So once you score, you have to bake. Okay, so baking, your temperature is gonna be determined by the type of dough that you're making. Lean yeast doughs that you guys are doing today are usually baked between 500 and 600 degrees. You'll notice that my ovens today are set to 400. Um, that's because I knew that we were probably not going to be using steam. Okay, so because we're using an egg wash today, the egg wash is going to burn at a higher temperature. So I reduced the temperature of the oven because of that. But also, um, between us, there was a maintenance man in here yesterday and he was touching a lot of buttons on the oven and I think he screwed some stuff up. So he screwed up the settings on the heat distribution and stuff like that. So until I fix what he did, we're going at a lower temperature so that I don't burn anything, okay? Uh, rich yeast doughs that we'll do a little bit later, you bake at a lower temperature, okay? Your last step is cooling. Cooling doesn't seem like a very important step, but it's actually one of the most important steps. You just did all of these 11 steps to get to the end, to bake a beautiful piece of bread that has a beautiful crust and color and shine and interior texture. Now, if you don't cool it, you're gonna destroy all that work. If you take a hot piece of bread right out of a 600 degree oven and you cut into it, all of those starches that are on the inside are all gonna to stick together. So instead of having a loaf of bread that's nice and tall, it's gonna and it's all gonna stick. That's number one. Number two, if you were to take the dough straight from baking and then wrap it in plastic wrap and throw it in the freezer to save it, that crust is essentially getting steamed. All of that heat that's on the inside of your dough is now trapped between the plastic wrap and it's gonna soften the crust that you just worked to get, okay? So don't forget about cooling. Cooling preserves your interior crumb and your exterior crust. Okay? Questions on this? You're prepared to write all this on a quiz? Yes. 